I was walking along the road with two friends. The sun went down. I felt a gust of melancholy. Suddenly, the sky turned a bloody red. I stopped, leaned against the railing, tired to death, as the flaming skies hung like blood and sword over the blue-black fjord and the city. My friends went on. I stood there trembling with anxiety, and I felt a vast, infinite scream through nature. Widely regarded as one of the world's most famous and recognizable paintings, the scream by Edvard Munch, or more accurately named the scream in nature, is one man's experience of a walk in Oslo one evening. That's the moment depicted here, a moment of feeling untethered, of feeling alone in this vast universe. The painting's simplicity has helped it to define our shared collective experience of feeling anxiety sitting just below the surface of the self. The scream was imitated, parodied, and after its copyright expired, it was outright copied. You may find that you are more familiar with this image than you think. Maybe you've seen Andy Warhol's series of silk screen prints, or Kevin McAllister's poster for the movie Home Alone, or the ghost face mask in the scream series of horror movies, and most widely used of them all, this emoji, face screaming in fear made to resemble the subject of the painting. The figure on the bridge, who may even be symbolic of Monk himself, feels the cry of nature, a sound that is sensed internally rather than heard with the ears. Monk wanted to express internal emotions through external forms and thereby provides a visual image for a universal human experience. He became familiar with death at a very early age. His mother died of tuberculosis when he was only five years old. He lost one of his sisters to the same disease when he was just 13 and he himself also had tuberculosis. Not to mention, his other sister suffered from severe depression and was committed for life to a mental health asylum. After the death of his mother and sisters, his father, who was a doctor and an extreme Christian fundamentalist, saw the occurrence of severe life-threatening tuberculosis that had affected his family as God's punishing illnesses, to which the only response could be remorse and prayer for being flawed. His father suffered from deep depression and violent temper, as well as fanatical visions of his own and his surviving children's eternal damnation in hell. Traumatized by the constant experience of death, Monk was often affected by depression, which is regularly visible in his work. His artwork often deals with themes of anguish, melancholy, fear, death, and pain. We can often see his use of shadows and rings of colors around his figures that emphasizes an aura of fear and anxiety. Monk's painting titled Self-Portrait in Hell is made to express his feelings regarding his life at the time as a man and as an artist, a private hell. He recalled shortly after his 70th birthday, sickness, insanity, and death were the dark angels standing guard at my cradle and they have followed me throughout my life. His father's oppressive and religiously fanatic temperament, on top of his own poor health, helped inspire his dream or rather nightmarish artistic vision. His fear of life and his illnesses are indistinguishable from himself, and their destruction would destroy his art. Another painting of monks that displays his inner struggles with mental illness is Sick Mood at Sunset Despair painted in 1892. It's very similar to the scream at first glance. The colors, the location, the format, the proportions. Everything is identical except for the main character. Here, the piece didn't challenge the traditions of painting like the scream did. The scream was Monk's breakthrough. Monk made several attempts before arriving at this famous figure. His initial sketches show an elegantly dressed man gazing across the fjord with an air of melancholy. A fine image, but not particularly iconic. Gradually, the figure becomes more anonymous, both universal and non-human, before turning towards the viewer in its distinctive pose. The non-specific appearance of the subject permits everyone, regardless of age, gender, or cultural background, to recognize in it something of themselves. The painting consists of three main areas. The bridge, which extends from the bottom right to the mid-left section of the foreground, the landscape, which includes a lake or a fjord, the shore, and some hills, and the sky at the top, which stimulates a sense of motion with its curving lines of orange, yellow, red, and blue-green tones. The two faceless figures on the top left are Monk's friends that had accompanied him in that moment. They continue on their path and have left Monk behind. 
Lines are of great importance here. The bridge and the figures are strictly linear and geometrically positioned. Yet the natural elements, the landscape and the sky, appear to weave into one another. He has achieved to be extremely expressive with his choice of brush strokes whilst not including anything of form. On the top, there's a barely visible pencil inscription that translates to could only have been painted by a madman. This was only discovered after it was photographed with an infrared camera. A study of the handwriting shows that the comment was added by Monk. The theory has been that he added the inscription after the critical comments made when the painting was first exhibited at the Blomkist Gallery in Oslo in 1895. At the time, there was a lot of criticism and many questioned Monk's sanity. So much so that one medical student even called him crazy. There is good evidence that Monk was deeply hurt by that criticism, being sensitive to the mental illness that was prevalent in his family. The scream represents a key work for the symbolist movement and is an important inspiration for the expressionist movement of the early 20th century due to its vibrant and unrealistic colors. It shows a new way of creating art. It pushed symbolist artists to confront questions regarding the nature of subjectivity and visually depicting it. As Monk himself put it in a notebook entry on subjective vision written in 1889, it is not the chair which is to be painted, but what the human being has felt in relation to it. Edvard Monk never married and with few family members around him, referred to his paintings as his children and hated to be separated from them. For the last 27 years of his life, he lived alone just outside of Oslo. Increasingly revered but increasingly reclusive, he surrounded himself with work. When he passed away in 1944 at the age of 80, the authorities discovered behind locked doors on the second floor of his house a collection of over 1,000 paintings, 4,000 drawings, and 15,000 prints. Yet in a final irony of his difficult life, Monk is famous today as the creator of a single image, which has obscured his overall achievement as a pioneering and influential printmaker and painter.